What's up, Z Pack? It's your boy Z Dog MD. Check it out. I'm live and direct from Casa de Z Dad and Z Mom, my ancestral home in Clovis, California, where we are on the road, soon to be in the Bay Area. The Z Pups are over there eating junk food fed to them by none other than Z Mom MD, who loves to fatten up little children like a legendary evil witch in Hansel and Gretel or something, but the kids love it. They want to live here forever. Um, Mrs. Dog is working on some stuff, and Z Dad is trying to learn how to use a Macintosh, which I bequeathed to him ever since he got hacked on his PC, and I decided, you know what? You're gonna be better off with a Mac because you just will, and I, I just happen to be a little bit biased. Apple for life, son. Anyways, I want to talk today, today in today's Incident Report Mobile about um, Attorney General Jeff Sessions and the 400 plus medical professions that have just been charged in the largest healthcare fraud takedown like ever, I think. Uh, and it's interesting because it wraps in these ideas of what it means to be an ethical professional, how does this relate to Health 3.0 where we're actually trying to do the right thing for patients and each other. And then we're looking at $1.3 billion in fraudulent Medicare claims coupled with pill mill opioid prescribing behavior. And I wanna come out quite hard on this because to me, it's a tantamount ethical and moral violation when someone who is a very trusted figure in society, a nurse, a doctor, a pharmacist, and it seems like those are the three big professionals that were stung in this, about 56 of the 412 charged were doctors, then you have nurses, pharmacists, et cetera, and a lot of these guys were running illegal pill mill operations. For example, a doctor in a Houston clinic is accused of writing 12,000 prescriptions for opioids, and that's enough for two million illegal doses. Um, and it seems like a lot of these situations, doctors were exchanging the prescriptions for cash, people were going out and either selling them on the black market or using them illegally, and there were a few documented cases of people coming to fake treatment centers that really had no business treating opioid addiction that have sprung up in response to the opioid crisis. Um, the insurance being billed, them being billed, and then no significant care being delivered, and in some cases, them being allowed to use drugs on the property. So uh, they shut some of those down too, it looks like, and um, some of those patients went on to overdose and die. So my feeling is, if you're involved in a pill mill operation as a physician or a nurse or a pharmacist or anybody in the know in the healthcare profession, why shouldn't we, if you're caught and convicted, convict you of murder? Especially if you can actually document that people overdosed after using your drugs. Now this was actually done in Southern California to a physician It set a, a kind of terrifying precedent. She was just inappropriately prescribing um, narcotics and kind of a pseudo pill mill situation, I forget her name, and she was arrested and I believe convicted of a very serious crime, whether it was manslaughter or murder, I don't remember, but it was not good. Now Heather DC says pill mill people need jail time, it's true, and then Karen Palmer says you can see Z's elephant, it's true, so my unconscious Disgust mechanism is really disgusted with this behavior because here we are talking about, you know, we take a Hippocratic oath to do no harm and these people are above all doing harm. And it's the worst kind of harm because it's in the service of greed. So they're trying to make a buck at the expense of people's lives, either killing people or damaging their lives or others' lives or their families' lives. Now, uh, Elizabeth uh, Smith Gaines says, I don't know about murder, but certainly a major case for manslaughter. I think at the minimum, manslaughter sounds like a valid, uh, a valid option. I see one of my favorite pain specialists, KT, has joined us, so she might want to weigh in because uh, she deals with not only um, chronic pain, uh, opioid dependency, but also a lot of docs probably who are not on the up and up um, in terms of how they prescribe. Maybe voluntary manslaughter, since these doctors know what they're doing, says Liliana Cook. So, you know, we're getting into the we're getting into the weeds of what do you charge them with. The bottom line is this is a betrayal of the profession. It is unconscionable, and we all have seen these things in action. Not surprisingly, South Florida produced the largest number of suspects, 77, who were charged with a combined 141 million 
in false billings for home care, mental health services, and pharmacy fraud. Now, this is a crime on so many levels. Not only does it hurt patients directly, it hurts other caregivers and organizations trying to be more 3.0. Organizations that are trying to get paid to generate actual outcomes now have to overcome the stigma of the abuse from a, a bunch of 1.0 uh, clinicians who are gaming the system and trying, based on greed, to um, accomplish financial gain at the expense of others. Um, I'm just pulling up your comments on my little iPad here because it's easier to see. Um, and Liz Mongeri asked, dude, do you know any of these prescribers? I did, uh, and they were caught, um, and I'm not gonna say how, but we see this all the time. We also know people who are just irresponsible with prescribing opiates. Now, here's the thing. Jeff Sessions has come out and said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna rein this in. And I think almost universally people are saying finally, right? Now, the one con in this is to say that by pulling these guys off, off the street, they're dispensing pills. What's gonna happen to those addicts and those who are dependent on those drugs? And not to mention the people with legitimate pain who are not gonna have access anymore. So there must have been some legitimate patients in the mix. Uh, and this could raise the, the question of are we gonna lead to deaths in the short run from people going to heroin, overdosing, et cetera. Um, and this is a valid question because there's really two sort of populations we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the new flow of creating new addicts and dependents. And by shutting down these pill mills, we've put the brakes on that, at least in those areas, because there's less people handing the stuff out like candy. However, what happens to the existing stock of people who are dependent on opioids or addicted? Well now they're gonna to have to find their opioids somewhere else and that's where it gets difficult. It seems that the data seems to suggest that they're gonna potentially move on to less expensive options like heroin, which are considerably more dangerous. Um, although prescription drugs are dangerous enough as it is. Uh, Amanda Udi, uh, we are asked, we are trained to ask patients about pain. It's the fifth vital sign and we're supposed to trust the patient's rate of their pain. So this fifth vital sign thing has been um, an ongoing discussion with us, CPAC. Is it a good idea? Joint Commission, CMS, et cetera, uh, <clears throat> saying that we'd been under treating pain in the 90s and 2000s and then putting in this edict. Well, we've seen what's happened. Now we are uh, compelled to treat it as a vital sign and, and medicate it to the point where, yes, we're hopefully managing chronic pain better, but we're now over treating expected pain. And we've set people's expectations in a certain way that they expect a magic pill to make them feel better when, in fact, sometimes things hurt. Uh, especially acutely, right? And the side effect of all this is people with legitimate chronic pain are now left to suffer as the pendulum swings the other way. Doctors are now, after this, terrified to prescribe narcotics. Um, they're thinking twice and three times and they're having tough conversations with patients. But at the same time, it's gonna be harder for people with legitimate pain to get refills and to follow up. Now, there's a long-term question about long-term opioids and chronic pain that I'm gonna leave out of this discussion. I'll leave it for the pain specialist, but we've kind of touched on it in the past. Is it even the right drug for long-term pain? Um, being a pain management patient, it's hard to read these comments. I just got my Charlotte's web card packet today. I wish I knew what that what that was, uh, Marsha Garthwaite. Fill us in, I, I missed out on that. I don't know what that is. Wayne Liu, Obama released drug dealers, claimed they were nonviolent and didn't deserve prison. How can we throw jo docs in jail for the same crime? Wayne Liu. Wayne, this is a great question. Now, I'm gonna to try to give a transpartisan answer to this question because you can pick sort of, you can take, you can answer this on party lines and say, well, okay, we gotta be really tough on drugs and put all the dealers in jail, or we have to see uh, drug abuse as a rehabilitatable um, thing, uh, so on and so forth. Now, the way I would argue this situation is, I actually agree with what Jeff Sessions did here in going hard after these particular uh, 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 drug dealers because they are violating a sacred oath and they are trusted in society. This isn't a kid on the street who's coming out of poverty trying to hustle to get his, you know, uh, to get money to survive or, or support his family. I'm not saying all drug dealers are like that. I'm saying these are people who have a means to make a living, who took an oath, who are trusted in society and they've betrayed that trust. In a way, they ought to be relegated to the deepest circle of hell or wherever you believe people go who are bad. 
um, whether it's jail or whatever, Hades. I like the river Styx myself because I like the band Styx because come sail away, come sail away, come sail away to jail. Uh, I just like that. Um, so my feeling is they should be treated uh, more harshly than your garden variety. Uh, now, now here's my thing. Drug users should not be in jail. That's my statement and I'm sticking to it. Um, I actually think drugs should be legal and highly regulated. Uh, but I'm a bit of a libertarian when it comes to that and people can disagree with me. I think compassionate, rational people can disagree on this topic, but uh, we'll have another show on that uh, separately. Pam Murphy, we would see this at the pharmacy. We would always call the doctors to question the prescriptions. Most of the time the doctor would say, just give it to them, the patient. Uh, it made it immensely difficult to work in the best interest of the patient and caused risk to our safety when the patients were irate, screaming about how they paid for the script also, doctors writing meds for diagnosis outside their field, not all are like this. It makes it hard for those who work in the best interest of the patient. Pam Murphy. Pam, this comment is amazing, and this makes me so, this makes my elephant so furious because the actions of these criminal physicians, all right, and their accomplices throughout the healthcare disciplines, it harms everybody across the spectrum of care. The pharmacists on the front lines are put in this horrible position, right, having to fill these clearly fraudulent scripts from a doctor who's clearly a criminal and should be in prison for manslaughter or murder, okay? They have to do that, and then it stigmatizes everything. It puts the frontline pharmacists in danger because these patients are either in withdrawal or they're agitated or they feel like, well, I paid for this script, why can't I get it filled? The whole thing is horrible. Now, here's a question. What are the incentives in our broken ass health 2.0 system that lead us down a path where this is even possible? Be honest, people, human behavior is as it, as it is. If you give people an incentive to, to abuse something for money and they feel like they're not gonna get caught, and they're already conditioned by years of medical training to think that they're you know uh, uh, somehow immune from problems, right? Or, or whatever, what, what have you, in terms of how uh, our medical system conditions us in our, in our years of training. And then you put them in a position where they got a ton of loans, they, they feel like the regular practice of medicine is so hard because of Health 2.0, and they're put in this position, well, why not set it up so they're never put in that position? Like there's something going on with how we're allowed and able to practice medicine uh, uh, with regard to opioids and other uh, medications that has, has definitely put us in the position. Pain is the fifth vital sign. Um, the pharmaceutical industry pushing these drugs is safe and effective for pain without addiction risk in people without a history of addiction. It's crazy, crazy. So there's culpability throughout. Um, Holly Talmadge, I see a pain management doc who will not prescribe narcotics. As a patient, I had to sign a document that at my first appointment saying that I would not use narcotics while under his care. I respect that, Holly Talmadge. Now there are definitely docs like that and I think their numbers are increasing. It's a tough thing to do, but they're trying their best to use multidisciplinary approach to pain management. I get a lot of angry messages from people with chronic pain that when I read between the lines, I realize they're dependent on narcotics. You know, they may not be addicts, but they are dependent on this drug and they are terrified someone's gonna take it away. And reading further between the lines, it's not, it's not even controlling their pain. So it's not an effective drug, they're still on it, they're meant for short-term management of pain, and yet here we are still using an ineffective drug that's leading to dependency and behavioral issues. Why the hell are we doing that? So these docs, these pain docs, are very brave to do what they do. Um, Kat Trav, who is one of those pain docs, says multidisciplinary approach is the only way. I agree, I agree, I agree. And multidisciplinary approach is not, here's your narcotics, that'll be 100 bucks. That's criminal, right? And we all know this. Jessica McDavid, how do we deal with screaming patients who know how to work the satisfaction angle, Jessica McDavid? Well, I think um, we have to be very honest with them and say, yeah, I know you're gonna jack me on my satisfaction scores, but I, I don't wanna live uh, on my conscience with an overdose or somebody getting a drug for something that will harm them. So I can't do this. You can see another physician and feel free to do whatever you need to do on the, on the, on the uh, patient satisfaction review and then we mobilize as a group ZPAC and we change the patient satisfaction component because it's dumb. The way we do it now is dumb. Patient experience is important, but the way that we measure it now is dumb. And by the way, talk about people who ought to be like thrown in prison. 
I can't really say this. I'm not going to say this because I'm going to get end up in trouble. But let's just say I'm not a big fan of organizations that profit on um, patient satisfaction measurements. Now, I am a big fan of organizations like the National Patient Safety Foundation or the Institute of Medicine that, or Institute for Healthcare Improvement that value the patient experience and the patient voice and want to measure it appropriately. I am a fan of that. Okay. So let's just be clear where uh, I sit in terms of uh, how to build Health 3.0. Um, Colleen Garvey says, I'm glad I'm no longer on Tramadol. I'm glad too. You know, it, it, these really aren't chronic medications for most people, they really aren't. Um, Nicole Puente, having a nationalized system for medical records accessible to physicians and pharmacies may help. My mom had narcotic addiction, saw four different types of doctors and three different pharmacies. So Nicole, I've been advocating this for a long time, a national electronic health registry. Now the problem is Americans hate that sort of privacy violation, but I feel like it would solve a ton of problems. It would make life a lot easier for frontline clinicians and for patients, and it would solve a lot of issues from HIPAA all the way down to uh, narcotic and, and opioid uh, misuse. And plugged into that program ought to be all the pharmacies and all the um, uh, compounding pharmacies and the marijuana dispensaries and everybody who's plugged into the healthcare system, including the naturopaths and the herbal supplement people and all the other people that are giving you quacky meds that are really basically glorified placebos or worse and can harm you when your doc doesn't know that you're taking them. Uh, so I've seen cases of liver failure and I'm not saying this doesn't happen in Western medicine, I'm saying that we ought to know everything people are taking and it's very hard to do without a unified record. So I'm a big big proponent of that. Um, Melissa Moran, people totally underutilize the amazing power of NSAIDs and Tylenol. Usually it does a better job than narcotics anyways, uh, Melissa Moran. They do, and actually when you combine them, not, and not everyone can tolerate those drugs, and there are problems with those drugs as well, but there are non-opioid modalities for pain that are very effective. Um, again, sometimes you need opioids, but, but the way we give them out, look guys, we use more, oh, we lose like 80% of the world's opioids. The U.S. Do we have 80% of the pain? Come on. It tells you something's wrong, deeply. The fact that people are dying, the fact that towns in Ohio are like threatening not to give Narcan uh, on third strikers who call in with overdose, it tells you something's wrong. Like we are a sick, sick population if we're relying on opioids so much. Um, pill mill docs are just legalized pushers, Moonbeam says. I say they are murderers. So I'm going to be quite firm on this. They are murderers. They are knowing accomplices to murder. That's what they are. And they need to be stopped. Now, um, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about Jeff Sessions in general, but I will say he's done a good thing here. The danger is, again, now we've left a bunch of addicts without a means to treatment. The hope is that this will be coupled with treatment access and programs that allow people to get care. Otherwise, we're going to see deaths. Right, so we have to look at the bigger system picture and the healthcare utilization that's gonna result. These guys are all gonna hit the ER now and go, the only thing that helps me starts with a D and Dr. Son, so he used to give it to me, but now he's in jail for murder. Um, sorry, my computer keeps going to sleep. I should set that before I do my live. Speaking of which, let's go to a quick ad because uh, we need to support the show and I really appreciate it when you guys sit through the 15 seconds. Uh, Facebook will serve you something purportedly unique to you. I love to hear what you guys actually see and we're still part of this trial with Facebook ads. So uh, just hang with me and we'll come back and we're gonna take more of your comments, talk about opioid uh, prescribing pill mills and whether these doctors should be, and nurses and pharmacists should be convicted of murder. I got a Hewlett Packard ad for a secure database. So I, I guess I'm in danger of being hacked according to Facebook. Um, Kayla Minton, I have uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS, and I have had 11 surgeries on my joints and a dead femur, and honestly, the gabapentin works better than any narcotic, Kayla Minton. Kayla, I wanna say something about EDS because I've done um, little fundraisers for EDS in the past. Many of the Z-Packers suffer or know people who've suffered from Ehlers-Danlos uh, uh, connective tissue disorder, very, very painful condition, many different variants of it, poorly understood and recognized by healthcare providers. Um, Y'all suffer with chronic pain, lots of issues, acute pain, and 
some of the most compelling uh, arguments that I've gotten are from patients with EDS about how to manage pain and, and how to be sensitive and compassionate. And they are a wonderful group of patients and I support them wholeheartedly in their efforts to get uh, better understanding and awareness about their condition and better control of their symptoms. I'm glad gabapentin works for you because that is absolutely a tremendous uh, option. So um, let's see, Fallon Stevens works on a rehab unit, not drug rehab, and our doctors don't really order narcotics because of such effects that the meds can have on patients, especially when they're doing neurofeedback and such. So again, like these drugs have serious effects, including constipation, which doesn't really improve in a lot of people. Um, let's see here. Ba -ba 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 -ba. More comments. Stop the satisfaction survey, says Patrick Slape. Who gives a shit what the patient thinks as long as you know the patient received the appropriate care they required? So here's the balance, Patrick. This is where I think it gets tricky because we as caregivers can fall into the trap of screw the patients, we know what's best. And I understand that trap because I fall into it occasionally. We give you the medicine you need, not the medicine you think you need. However, we in healthcare are notoriously bad at listening to the patient. So the patient's voice matters. Now, if the patient's voice seems misguided, then it's our role as shepherds to help guide. So that means we need to have them get the experience that they've been heard, that we're advising them, and that, and that we've at least listened to what they're saying. This is where I think we fail a lot of times in Health 2.0 because we don't have the time to do it. We're too busy looking at a screen. We're too busy worrying about productivity. We're worried about being sued. We're worried about our patient satisfaction and that harms the entire uh, relationship. So when we get to 3.0 and it's really about relationships more than anything, that's when I think the patient experience will matter and their voice will be heard. But sometimes that means tough love. So uh, that's my response to that. Let's see. Uh, I'm so sick of narc abuse, says Christina Hernandez. I think I've developed a reflex of rolling my eyes back in my head as soon as I hear any narcotic. I think a lot of us have. It's a conditioned response now for, uh, for many of us. Now, Kelly McDonald, turn that around. If you were the patient and we told you your opinion didn't matter, how would you feel? Exactly. They are the center of why we do what we do. So we cannot throw out you know, the patient with the bong water. We, we have to recognize that the patient voice is paramount, but the way that we recognize it now is this very artificial assembly line approach where patient satisfaction, have it your way, Burger King, hotel, that's not what a hospital is. A hospital approach, and this is what I tell my patients in the hospital, get you safely through the most dangerous place on the planet, which is a hospital, and out home safely. And sometimes that means things that don't intuitively feel right, but you should, as a patient, always have your voice heard. If you think something doesn't make sense, ask. If you are against something, let us know. But we're not gonna give you everything you ask for because our primary mission is to keep you safe and get you out of the hospital as safely as possible. So sometimes that means telling you, you know, it's time to go. Sometimes it means, uh, but, 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 but listening, you know? listening very carefully. And I'll tell you the example of a mistake that I made when I was a, a, a an arrogant young attending instead of an arrogant old attending was, uh, you know, I had a 90 year old patient who um, had shoulder pain, came in from um, home, was active and uh, was complaining of the shoulder pain, no other, uh, you know, nothing else going on. And the family was telling me, the patient was just sweet and just was very compliant with whatever you would say. The pain got better, a little tincture of time. We did some studies, some scans. We didn't see anything. And we said, okay. I said, well, you know, we need to get her home quickly and safely uh, or to a skilled nursing facility. And that's what, we, that's what I was uh, proposing to the family. And the family was pushing back. And they said, you know, you're not listening to us. There's something wrong with her. We know it. You don't know. Um, and a skilled nursing facility is not where she needs to be. You need to figure out what's going on. And I said, we've done the tests that we need to do. Um, we don't think there's anything left to do in the hospital and it's dangerous for her to be here. She's gonna get a secondary infection, something's gonna happen. And it's not that a nursing home is vastly safer, but she can't go home because clearly she needs rehab, she's 90. This little bit of time in the hospital has deconditioned her enough that she needs to have some uh, very intensive physical therapy and the supervision and medical management that comes from a skilled nursing. So they finally agreed went to the skilled nursing, brought her back the next day with fevers. Turns out she had undiagnosed endocarditis. 
and had embolized a small emboli to the shoulder joint and it was an early septic arthritis that showed up on nothing and you know white count everything was normal no fevers when we took care of her so the family was absolutely right now I've struggled with this years later and I had I had this out with the family afterwards I kind of sat, sat with them and I said I want to know how I can prevent myself and others from making this mistake in the future because I think and I, I had consulted ID and all these other things I think I did everything right but the one thing I didn't do was really carefully uh, hear you out and think was there anything else I could be missing I don't know and uh, having that conversation turned them from very antagonistic to being an ally in trying to figure out how to prevent this from happening uh, in the future so we do need to listen to our patients to the best degree that we can we have to be humble in the face of our inability to know everything but at the same time we do need to be tough when patients uh, push back and are asking for things that are inappropriate particularly you know inappropriate narcotics that sort of thing so on that note, I'm going to wrap it up with a few more comments here. Let's scroll it down and see what we got, because I think I closed my iPad. Um, yep, sometimes we need Dr. House to get to the bottom of an illness that no one can figure out. It's bad. It's true. I mean, it's hard to know when you need Dr. House, right? Um, chronic pain is very poorly managed, says Georgia Jams, uh, Gam Sick. Um, I took ibuprofen chronically at increasing higher doses for mixed connective tissue disease until I had a heart attack. So see, all these drugs have potential side effects and chronic pain, you really have to get the root of what's going on with that. And that takes a multidisciplinary patient sort of 3.0 approach. All right, on that note, guys, I wanna thank you for joining us today for Incident Report Mobile out of ZDAD's home office. Um, I'm itchy and allergic in this town, Clovis, because everything is pollenized and smogified and farmified, but I still love it because it's home. And uh, I'll see you guys um, tomorrow. We're driving up to the Bay Area. Maybe uh, I'll let Mrs. Dog drive and do another podcast uh, from the car. Peace. I love you.